Okay, and I think we're live. <laughs> Hi, everybody, on next episode of Disruption Talks by NetGuru. My name is Paula Steinwald. I'm a product manager, and I'll be hosting this episode for you. Today with me, there is Helen Bjork from North Mill Bank, who's also a product manager. Hi, Helen. Hello. Hey, how are you today? I'm really good, thank you. How are you? Good. I'm very glad we're going to have this amazing chat about product management. <laughs> <laughs> Me too. <laughs> uh, so the first question is kind of obvious, I think. Like, what's there behind you? Well, I think we have quite a nice skyline here behind me. We can do a little Stockholm tour. Uh, I'm currently at our uh, head office in the middle of Stockholm. So uh, usually when the weather is better, you can see more, but it's a, it's a great view. It is. It's kind of amazing. I know also that you have an office in uh, Katowice in Poland. Exactly. Is the there as much amazing as this one or not that much? Yeah, it was uh, at our Katowice office last week, actually. And uh, it's even higher up. It's a, a taller building. Uh, so it's really nice there as well. Probably the weather is kind of similar. So <laughs> at least that's... They actually had snow and like real winters. So I was surprised. <laughs> Yeah, it's no, no longer here, so. <laughs> okay, cool. Uh, so let me start with the first one, jumping into our set of questions already. But before that, I just reminded myself, uh, for anybody who's listening to us, if you have any questions to Helen, Helen throughout the whole talk that we're having, feel free to post them on LinkedIn comments. We'll be reviewing them and um, sharing with Helen while we talk, if the time allows. Great. Okay. And right now I think we're ready. So the first one, Helen. If I think, you know, of a product manager role, it's not kind of a job <laughs> that you think about, you know, a person dreaming when you're in the kindergarten and bragging to other kids, you know, I want to be a product manager when I'm old. Um, like people's journey into product, it's very different uh, for everybody. And I wonder what's been your journey? Like, how did you end up where you are right now? Uh, well, today I'm the product manager for North Mill's uh, payments team. And I've been here at North Mill for about a year and a half leading that team. And uh, like you said, the, the journey to product management is never obvious when you're not there yet. But I think just uh, looking back at the career and every choices that I've made, it's all kind of led up to product management. And even in those roles that are not specific to uh, this is a product manager role, it still has to do with product management. Uh, so I think uh, one of my uh, jobs that I had during um, my um, university studies uh, was that I worked at EF for language travel. And uh, those roles were um, really interesting in that way where you're super close to the customer. You had them uh, with you all the time because you were traveling with them. And you got so much instant feedback. So just having these surveys that five days into the trip and then in the end of the trip, it really made it easier for you to kind of change the, the product that you sold already, uh, but to make them happy and make sure that they were leaving and, and reviewing your five when they left. Uh, so um, that that really is product management, but I didn't realize until now <laughs> that it was just a few years back. And then um, after that, I started working at Benefy, which is a benefits platform. I uh, worked uh, with product development for pension and insurance uh, towards bigger banks and insurance companies here in Sweden. And uh, uh, yeah, then I ended up here at North Mill. I thought their journey and the opportunity here was amazing to be on. And so much has happened since I started. It's going to be really interesting to see what happens here in the upcoming years. Wow, that sounds like in a really interesting journey. <laughs> and as you mentioned, like for everybody, this is so different. And I think what you mentioned that um, sometimes we work in some roles that are not called product managers, but after you like le really learn what the product manager is, you find out that actually you've been doing a work on the product manager. 
exactly it might might not be as structured uh, yeah. to start with but you're still doing some of it kind of in your blood right <laughs> Must exactly be. Uh, can you share a little bit more so what is it uh about product manager role in north mill like how does it look like what do you do here so uh, North Mail is a Swedish uh, new bank. We are 150 employees and are in uh, Sweden, Norway, Finland, and also have an office in, in Poland, in Katowice. And uh, we received our banking license back in 2019. Uh, so that's really uh, been the journey that we have been on to become this bank. And I think that reflects a lot of what the duties are as a product managing uh, manager here um uh it's because we are still quite small even if we are a bank it means that as a product manager you're doing anything from uh helping the product teams with uh your engineers understanding the actual problem that we're trying to solve what is the domain that we're under how does payments work in in sweden or in other countries what do we need to support uh but also uh, aligning with management and with customer center, what do customers say each time that they call? What problems do they actually have doing customer interviews? So it's really uh, anything <laughs> that comes your way that's custom or product specific. Well, sounds like a product manager's role <laughs> by the book. <laughs> exactly. So I think it's much easier when you're in a in a smaller company because you can take this responsibility on a broader uh, level than you would with a bigger company maybe where your role is a bit more uh, thin but here uh, if someone are, asks about cards and payments they know who to ask <laughs> which is great that's great so you mentioned you're a product manager for a payments team in particular exactly. could you share a little bit more like what does this team takes care of yeah so when uh, when i started we uh, had a card, uh, but we realized that uh, that support that we had uh, back then and the goals that we had both to go international and when it comes to building really uh, personal uh, products towards our customers, we needed to look at a broader perspective on cards and payments to see uh, what other support do we need and what type of suppliers do we need to really accelerate in the long run. So uh, back then, uh, we decided to kind of change our strategy uh, towards what we're working on today. Uh, so right now, we're, for the past uh, year, we've been working on uh, launching a new debit card uh, with new suppliers. So one year ago, we started out from a blank sheet of paper. We had uh, uh, nothing really to start with, and we just built everything from the startup. So that's been super exciting. Um, I mean, the team has done amazing work. I don't know if there's many other banks out there that can do this in that short amount of time. Uh, so it's really interesting to see uh, what this product can do for North Mill. Uh, so hopefully we'll be launching uh, early next year. We've been piloting here for six months already. So it is live in production. It's just uh, hidden for, uh, for some of us so that we can really make sure to pressure test and see that everything is working. Oh, wow, that sounds really impressive. And for sure, it's going to be like main topic of our talk today. So we'll get into details of that part. Um, I also want to like to iterate a little bit to the product manager role itself. Um, and ask you like, what made you get into that job? And what keeps you going, you know, because it's not an easy job. <laughs> let's let's say it out loud. Um, but apart from what keeps you going into it, I also wonder, was there any moment in your professional life that you regretted becoming a product manager? I've uh, never re regretted being a product manager. I think uh, it took a while to understand that this is what I want to do. Uh, it's quite a new title still. I think it's popped up so many jobs within product management in the past two years, but when when I went to school, no one talked about product management. Everyone talked about accounting or consultancy. So it wasn't really something that was brought up. Uh, but I really, what I love about it is that 
it sounds really, really cheesy, so I don't like saying it, but it is like being a small CEO of your product. And um, you can really make sure that that baby that you're building will succeed and you can make others as engaged about it as you are. And also that there is really no limitations. Uh, you have the management that is backing you. So if you want more, you can ask for more funding, for example, or more support. Uh, and then you can just go for it if you have any new ideas. And it really creates this kind of atmosphere for, for me that I love that if I want to do more, uh, there is nothing that is stopping. Uh, it's just, just really me and the team that sets the, the boundaries for uh, success and how much and what we want to do. And it, there is very few other roles that have this really um, yeah, freedom to do what you want. Um, so I think that's really what's amazing about being a, a PM. You know, you're selling it very well. Like <laughs> if I were thinking of becoming a product manager, actually it would <laughs> it would be something that would convince me. <laughs> That's good. <laughs> um, you know, in NetGuru, we have a team of around like 20 people who are product managers. And when I think of them, like each person is coming from so different backgrounds. Like also what we mentioned, like the journey has been so different. Uh, but at the end, everybody is a great product manager and it makes me wonder, and I kind of also wish for you to share your thoughts around it. Do you think there is any must have for a person in terms of qualities to have to become a successful product manager? Yeah, definitely. Like you said, the background is not the, the most important. It's more around your attitude towards solving problems, also taking in input. Uh, if you have this this product that's your baby, if someone doesn't like it, you need to be able to throw it away. And I think if you can't do that, then you're not gonna be a good product manager. And that's probably the, the hardest thing as well. When do you actually decide to stop what you've been working on for such a long time? So be just being really pragmatic and taking other people's opinions. If you can't do that, then you should choose something else. <laughs> Yes, I can relate with that. I think the way I try to describe it is that it's important to fall in love with the problem itself, not the, with the solution. So the solution is just means to resolve the problem, right? And that's so difficult when you're middle of the project because then, um, then you've already validated the problem, you're on your way, and maybe the solution takes a few months to build. So then you're all up in the solutions and sometimes you need to remind yourself on why are we actually doing this? Uh, so I think that's really, really important when you have these uh, products that take a lot longer to build. Yeah, I agree. Well, but still quite fun, isn't it? <laughs> Let's end on this. <laughs> okay. And jumping into North Mill uh, Bank itself and, you know, how exciting it is to be a challenger uh, bank as North Mill. Uh, so what's what's the latest? Uh, how the 2020 was for North Mill? How the 2021 is? And what's there for 2022? Yeah, so uh, like I mentioned, we, we got our banking license in the September of 2019. And uh, up to that point, everyone knew that the goal that we wanted was to become a bank. So it was really clear for everyone that this is where we're heading. Um, uh, so after that, uh, we uh, have been working a lot on our core products um, together with, uh, for example, savings account. Uh, we have uh, a product for uh, guaranteeing lower interest uh, rate on consolidating loans, for example. Um, and this banking license in 2019 came and then COVID came. <laughs> So six months after, uh, we had to really adjust to see how can we make sure that the company and the bank is stable for a long term and make sure that we have this stability to get through a pandemic in a good way, both in terms of uh, what products we're building um, and how we can take care of our customers uh, in this journey. So it's been uh, a journey that we've been on and we are still on, hopefully. Yeah, we can 
end the pandemic soon. Uh, but that that was the main focus for a while. And uh, also looking back at what we've done here in 2021, uh, we worked a lot still on our core products together with the card. That's uh, one of our most important products going forward. Uh, so we have had a, had a lot of work uh, that we are in the end of finishing. So it will be really exciting to see what 2022 will, uh, will give us. Sounds great. And maybe you can also give us a sneak peek into that <laughs> while we talk about the card launch. So you already mentioned that this was the main thing that you worked on with the team for some time already. And um, I feel like you're the best person to tell us about it then. <laughs> so maybe we can <laughs> maybe we can start with uh, sharing with everybody here uh, a little bit about the product itself. So what makes the cart special what uh, you know what's the target audience when and where you plan to launch it first and anything basically else that you would like to share about the product yeah so i think like going back to north mills vision it's really to improve uh, people's financial life so that's why we have these other products with really helping them with uh, interest for example making sure that they're as low as they they are even if you're with an incumbent bank and already have really low interest, we'll make sure to lower that as well. Um, and the savings product where we have 1% interest. So really we're coming from how can we actually help a normal uh, Swede or regular customers, those customers that banks regular don't want to have. If you don't have as much capital, for example, or you're not as interested in finance, how would you know what to uh, have and how can you really trust your banks to help you uh, to make sure that you make these good financial decisions so that uh, you have as much money in your pocket as possible. So that's the same the thought that we have with our card. How can we make our uh, card and personal account really work with both of our other products so that it's, it's a natural way into the bank, uh, but also to make sure that it's really the best a product out there for our customers so it's it's a product with uh, um, no fx uh, fees and no yearly or monthly fees so really my uh, are thinking about giving this back to the customer to make sure that if they're going abroad they can spend more money on ice cream or uh, more restaurants for example uh, so it's going to be really interesting to see how that is uh, being taken from the customers when we go go live um so we'll see okay great um so just to recap i feel like you're saying that the card is targeted uh, for like everybody in nordics this is correct uh yeah everybody in the nordics but we're focusing more on uh let's say 25 to 45 that type of age group mm -hmm. those that are um, starting to work, they're looking out there, they need to find a new relationship with a bank uh, mm -hmm. and to really follow that customer uh, up in their in the, in their age. So that's yeah. where we're starting and then we'll see. Probably we're thinking that these customers uh, post-pandemic will start traveling again uh, they will start to look into their finances and really want that uh, bank that makes sure that if you have money saved, then you will actually get uh, some interest on them and that you can access those money easy, fast. Uh, and then our um, longer term vision is to start to be personal about this uh, information and data. So we want them to come on that journey with us. That sounds like a lot of customer insights that you mentioned about the target audience that you're that you're aiming at. So we'll get into um, how you leverage the, the customer insights in building the products in just a sec. But before that, I wanted to um, like talk about product development of a product, which is a physical product, right? Because mm -hmm. I can't <laughs> exactly yeah and it comes with its own challenges it's not like you can you know roll back something over a night if it's buggy uh, in a couple of hours 
and just praise nobody <laughs> saw it. It is a product of cars, a physical car that's already on the market. So um, can you share some light on the product development process that you followed for that card and what kind of challenges you faced? Yeah, well, we're the only product team within the company that has both uh... Uh, a technical like a, an app uh, a product in that way but also this physical card right uh, so it's been really interesting to see how what type of colors do we like what effects how do we make it in the best way and then there's all these technical things within the product on how do you uh, make the chip work offline online uh, all the regulations around psd2 so there's so many layers of product development both in the physical and the digital products. So it's been uh, really interesting and we've learned so much. Um, we're now in our third it it iteration of uh, printing cards actually. Uh, and uh, it it's just about that, just doing small batches, learning what you like, what you don't like and doing it again. Uh, so it, it's really like any type of agile product development, even if it's a, is a physical product as well. That's super interesting. Like, thank you for sharing that. It's also like eye opening, right? Like, how can you experiment and do the iterations quick and learn quickly, even though at first you think it's challenging because it's a physical product. Mm. And it's it's not as quick with physical products. It takes time to print it and ship it and all of these things. So you need some time, <laughs> definitely. Uh, but you learn what you like, and there is just when it comes to like effects on cards. There's a whole industry out there that if you haven't tapped into it, there is so many options and so many new cool things that are coming with, um, for example, we have a card that's made of recyclable plastic. Uh, so that's really interesting for us. And there will be more environmental options uh, coming uh, with uh, ocean plastics and these things. So there's so much innovation happening in this industry as well. Wow, that sounds great. So what do you think will be the trend? in this, uh, in the card design in particular? Well, we've seen that a lot of like um, new banks have really simple design, right? There's uh, uh, like a lot of simple colors, simple logos, uh, a lot of metallic. Um, we have some of them coming out with metal cards. We have some coming out with biometric cards. So there's these things that have been a trend for a while. It's hard to say with like the actual physical product, how that will do when Apple and Google Pay take over more and more and uh, how customers will interact with their physical cards after that. There's mm -hmm. these, I would say clusters of users that don't understand the plastics anymore, mm -hmm. but that's a really, really small group still. Uh, so we need to support these physical plastics for a while, I think, um, even if we're a neobank. So we'll see really how that evolves in the future. Okay. Keep your fingers crossed. <laughs> exactly. It's even more uh, better for the environment not to print all of this plastic, but that would be a couple of years ahead. True that. Um, so getting into being customer centric. Uh, and I know that for North Mill, it's a big thing. Uh, also, I'm going to quote from your website that customer feedback loops and being explorers has always been the reason for North Mill beating heart. And we are convinced that a modern banking experience has its roots in people's needs and wishes. I wonder how does it look like in practice? How did you incorporate customer insights into the new cards development? Yeah, so the, because we had a card before, we could start really from there to see how did customers behave with it? What did they like? What did they not like? Uh, so we started there. And then there's so much information from, uh, from the big uh, schemes, Visa, MasterCard around payment behavior how to understand the, the customer really. Uh, so we continue on to do an, our analysis there and to find out more around what the type of problems do we think that we can solve and how would that fit in with all of the other products that we have within the bank. So it's really a puzzle of what you need and in, in what stages of life. 
And uh, after that, we started a, a panel. So we have a, a card panel that we call it. And these customers, uh, they get emails uh, every couple of weeks with questions around uh, what they think about uh, different features, how they behave on trips when they do payment or online, uh, just to help us prioritize that roadmap even closer. Um, and we also validate that type of information with customer interviews uh, from this panel. So go even deeper to with some customers. Um, and finally, we have customer center. So I think that's a true goldmine uh, for any people in product development, because that's where they call in with the real problems, not just the problems that you ask about. So it's really interesting there to, to see how customers call in with problems that we will solve later with the card uh, so that we can call them back and tell them, well, now it's, it's with, uh, in our product offering, you should get this. That's a very good strategy <laughs> to follow up. Yeah, on and I think it's sometimes daunting to uh, product managers that maybe don't work as much with user research to start, uh, but it really gives you a lot. And it's just better to start talking to people, ask things, do something. And then you were going to learn in the, in the uh, long run how to do it better. But if you don't start, then uh, you're just guessing. I think this is a very good tip. Just start, get out of your desk and talk with one customer to start with. Exactly. It's better to have a goal. Talk with one customer per week. And then you have something that you yeah. can have as, as your minimum requirement. Sounds good. We have a question from Grzegorz uh, about customer uh, insights. Um, and the question is, how do you collect wide customer feedback? which I think we partially already answered. Uh, but there's also another part of the question, which is how do you make decision what to include in the new product? So uh, usually when we get feedback around uh, the product, so far the feedback around what features customers really want is very limited. What uh, they say when I interview them around payments is that the most important thing is that it just needs to work. It's this type of product that it really, if it doesn't work, they really notice. But if it does work, then they don't say anything. Uh, so there has been very few that's asked about these uh, geographic restrictions or being able to um, restrict online purchases, set sp uh, spending limits, all of these cool features that are available already. Um, so in that case, it's been quite easy to prioritize. Uh, but other than that, we always try to look at even if there's a feature that customers really want, is there more people that would like this to try to validate that with other customers through either surveys, uh, just to ask specific questions uh, or more interviews. And if this feature, will it really uh, help you toward your long-term goal or short-term goal so that you're not doing things that are out of scope for yourself because then you're going to lose track of where you're really heading and also to lose focus for the launch. So it's better to push as, or at least for us, it's been better to push as much as possible post-launch and then we can do and validate those even more with more data later on and focus on making sure it works 100% for launch. Sounds MVP approach. <laughs> so. Yes, and it's so hard to do MVP when you have this massive project with a lot of compliance and so many players involved. Uh, anything from how the stores uh, handle payments to the networks, to the POS, actual the hardware or the software. Um, just to make sure that all of those have our bin tables updated. Uh, there's so many people just in the actual chain of making that payment work that if something goes wrong, it could be any of those parties and try to kind of look at uh, fixing those problems. It's not the easiest thing when you have that many people involved. I can imagine like stakeholder management overall in product management is a challenging thing, but I can imagine in fintech industry when the regulatory 
uh, aspect comes into play. It's like bigger stakes, right? That yeah, exactly. And there's uh, a lot of requirements to make sure that, especially when you have a payments product, it's uh, there is a lot of requirements from the FSCs on how it should be working, uh, what limitations you need to adjust to, and uh, how much uh, uptime and all of these things that you need to convey on too. And from the networks, how fast you need to be, which is also like another layer of complexity on making sure that both your system is uh, reliable, but also really quick. So with all those constraints that are kind of like out of your uh, influence, right? You just need to follow them. How do you still make it, make the experimentation and MVP approach happen for the product? So this is something that we really struggled with in the beginning. Uh, it was so difficult to scope the full product on when we think we would be able to launch. It got really abstractive to, with the team to see all of those tasks that we need to do. How long will they take? When do we think we're going to launch? Uh, so we really changed our approach into seeing after the interviews that I did, the most th important thing was to be able to make a payment. So we slim down everything else and just focus on how do we make payments work so that we can really start to test those in production as soon as possible and start to learn about behavior that merchants and banks do so that we can handle all type of cases. Uh, so it really helped all of the team to prioritize to make sure that we're not doing anything else. So the, there was no app, there was only an onboarding and uh, the ability to make payments to start with. So I was running around and trying to buy and do a lot of strange things and see how it works. And then we've had time here to to iterate and really make sure that it works when I go to Poland as well in the expected uh, behavior, I can do returns, all of these uh, strange things that uh, can happen. And the next step was instead to see, okay, so if we now have payments working, how can we make the app and the uh, environment there work as well? toward our customers. So then we developed our applications and features there that were most important. Uh, and on those, we already have had three iterations of design on things that were hard to understand or what we needed to improve. But just having something was more important to having something good to start with so that we can really make sure that we improve exactly what we think instead of having a lot of features, but no one understands what they are, how to do it. It's just more confusing. So uh, better to have less features, but really working and that customers understand what they're doing and why. So that's where our second focus really. And now our third focus is how can we make sure we have a launch where we can invite actual customers as well, uh, even if we iterated for already six months, uh, we are soon ready to support real customers in production and that we can be really comfortable that everything is 100% working and that they can really have a real nice card and payment solution going forward. Sounds great. <laughs> so it is possible still to experiment even in it is, but uh, as long as you try to get to production as fast as possible, that's uh, that's where you start to get the real data. Anyone can ask for cool things, but will they really use it? Probably that's not. True. That's the validation piece, right? So exactly. You won't validate until you have the real users telling no. you. <laughs> not at all. And they might not even tell you, just sitting next to them and they can't find buttons or something is unclear. So that's really good to just sit next to them and see where they get stuck. Or if they haven't done some of the actions that you're offering, is that really an action that you should be having? Maybe not. All very valid questions and kind of um, uh, linked with the next one that I have. Uh, you mentioned you already have some insights from the previous products. And now you mentioned like you also look at the usage of the um, particular capabilities, features of the product. I wonder if you use any data to look into that, like how being data driven in decision making on how to grow your product 
you know looks like in North Mill. Yeah, so I mean, for from uh, from my perspective, we only got data from this new product when we went into production. But even if it's a limited set of data, we can still see quite a lot on what's the most common uh, behaviors when merchants send us uh, uh, payments, for example, what type of situations do we need to handle, um, how fast are our applications, how fast are our response times. Uh, so all of these things are measurable and we try to have different type of KPIs for what's important uh, and what the goals are for us as a team so that we can really make sure that we are only doing those things that will make an impact now and the other things can wait until we have those goals set so we will make an impact on them later. Uh, but looking at the other products, well, there's so much data that we've had from the past with our products. And uh, North Mill has been around uh, since 2006. So, I mean, we have a lot of information and data on customers and our ultimate goal is to use this data to help them. How can we really make sure that they give, get insights? Uh, so we try to see ourselves as like the, the new Spotify or banking or how can we really disrupt for real? Uh, I think there's a lot of players that are trying, but there's still room for really disrupting banking and making sure that you are very personal and relevant toward your customer. Um, we have these like incumbent banks, they're really good at being personal. And then we have the new new banks uh, and they are really good at being digital, but just having this mix of being both, that's where we see ourselves that we can really make an impact. And I think it relates a little bit to the question that Radek asked. Um, so he asked, if you were to name the biggest challenge in 2022, and I will just uh, add to it, challenge, but also opportunity, and for digital payments slash biometric cards, what would it be? Anything about security, crypto, accessibility, or maybe totally different? Uh, I mean, it before we've launched, it's really hard to say. We try to be flexible. Uh, we have a thesis on how the launch will go, how much customer will, we will get in, uh, in 2022. But then uh, those are still just goals and we need more insights and more data to understand how we can reach those. Uh, so just building on new features um, and making sure how can we either build on uh, other core features around it or build our products more together uh, so that the journey is smoother or just completely new sets of features that go with the payment account or or the card. Uh, so we, we will see, it's hard hard to predict still. Um, it will be really interesting to, uh, for example, experiment with, uh, like uh, Radek here said, around different type of cards. Uh, I think there's there's a limited set of people, but there's still a group of people that are interested in, in these more gimmick type of cards like metal, gold, uh, or biometrics. So we'll see and, and test all of those things and see what will make uh, North will get more customers because that's will be our goal during next year, especially for cards and payments where we haven't been able to do that for uh, a year. So it sounds to me like you're very con uh, concise with the approach. So experiment and then validate and then grow. Exactly. And that makes it really hard to roadmap, right? <laughs> and uh, you know what you want to achieve, but you don't know yet how. So there's some features that you absolutely need to have because of uh, your banking license or PSD2 or any other regulations that the schemes have. But then there's these all of these other things that are more valuable to the customers and finding that one thing that will create most value, especially when it comes to uh, acquiring more customers, that's where we will be putting our focus to start with. That leads me actually to another question. <laughs> so you mentioned a little bit, I think, um, what could be the answer, but uh, product success. 
So this is a tricky thing, right? For every product manager, I think this is like daily uh, dilemma on how to decide what to build to get to the end game that you that you wish to get. Yeah. Um, and I wonder how did you define the success for the cart, and what made you help in making the decisions throughout the development process uh, about the product that will get you closer to the goal. And I think it's also related with the question from Pedro. Um, so he asked, how does the process for defining the goals at North Mill Bank looks like? And what's your contribution as a product manager in this process? Mm -hmm. So it's one thing to set goals uh, for your product that's already existing. It's been existing on the market for a while. The bank has had it for a long term. Um, you know, the usage, you know, the uh, acquisition channels and exactly how it's performed in the past. And then setting those KPIs are a lot easier than to look at a clean slate. So that data that we've looked at is more industry data when we're setting the, the goals for the card. Also setting parameters like where do we make money? Where do we lose money? What type of trackers do we need to um, make sure that they go up or down? Uh, fraud is one of those things, for example, or uh, usage uh, of the card, usage of the account. And uh, so all of these parameters go into the full bank and how we want to perform. Uh, so it's something that's set uh, together with management. And then we make sure to set those on a, a team level as well and make sure what can we really deliver on as a team and also in what way. So all of those KPIs are always validated together with the team to see, is this possible? And if we're trying to achieve these, how would we do it? And that's kind of where the roadmap uh, ends up. Sounds very good. So if I understand correctly, you start with the top, so with the strategy, so with the goals of the company, and then exactly. you think how the team could contribute. Exactly, because um, I mean, we've been working in product teams for two years now in North Mill, and uh, I think everyone loves that approach, especially me as a PM. I have a, a team that are experts as well, and they only work on this. So it's a lot easier to make sure that you have this success and that you have real commitment from the team to improve. And they want your solution to work and your product to work as much as you do. So it's really about doing this together and you get this community type of feeling and really can live core values by doing it in, in this way. Um, it makes me recall that I saw on your website that you put a lot of emphasis, uh, emphasis on the organizational culture actually in North Mill. And I wonder first, could you share a little bit more about like the values that you follow? And if you think that this is a relevant factor, the organizational culture in, um, in a team that is aiming at building successful products. I definitely think so. Like one of those things around being a product manager, especially in, in a smaller company is not only to grow the product, but also to grow the team. Uh, and to grow the team, especially remotely during a pandemic, it is tougher. So you need to really make sure that these core values that you have within your company and the culture that you want to um, have in the team is also uh, taught, informed, and that you really live and show by example. Uh, so what we try to do really there is all of those things that are work related around setting goals, setting commitments, understanding why uh, we want to do things, uh, and setting how together uh, and then also work on soft values like how do we actually have fun together how do we communicate how do we get uh, give feedback to each other what do we want to bring up in retros or how are we most efficient and just being able to have those open discussions on bi-weekly basis on just efficiency it's not um it's not something that we're trying to say that someone is not doing their job. It's more around everyone wants to reach this goal as soon as possible. Is there anything that I can do to help or anyone else in the company can do to help 
do you have enough uh, too many meetings or do you not have enough material to really highlight and do whatever you can to make sure that your team has everything they need to perform and also that they understand how to work together in the best way and that's really something that you always need to work on and it's really something that expires quickly uh if something goes bad someone leaves or anything like this you need to rebuild it every time again and i think a lot of people probably uh, miss this thing as well to make sure that if your team is not happy then your product will not succeed and those things really go hand in hand yes i totally agree and i think what you're talking about is also the um, part of the role of a product manager which is being a leader right for your exactly. team and you can't forget that really it's can't just lead your product then <laughs> no one is will will come with you on the journey true that so i wonder what would you say is the winning factor in shaping a team that builds successful products i think just to be be observant and listen uh, and to be humble all of these things um so that everyone can make their voice heard uh, that everyone can um, come with suggestions for example on the product or on the team or how you're doing uh, it's really important uh, together with really setting where we're going and why um, so that no one really needs to go to you for every decision they know what's most important because you've set this star of where we're heading and uh, that's really important yeah, I agree. So empowering, empowering the team, right? With the strategy, with the direction, so that the team is also like on this road together with you, not next to you. Exactly. Yeah. Um, so there's a question from Zofia and she is wondering how to interest people with existing financial habits in a new financial product how to make them take efforts related to transformation? Well, I think uh, looking at our customer segments, they're not the ones that have been most interested in finance before. And also that they don't always trust the banks or understand why they should make decisions, what the impact will be. So our, our um, what do you say? What we want to do really is to make sure that you don't need to always take these decisions actively and it, that it's not a big threshold to make good decisions. And we want to do this through really having good data to help that customer. How, for example, can that person save X amount of crowns per month by changing their behavior? What type of behavior should they be changing so that it's nothing that is uh, is difficult for them and nothing that they need to actively think about it's just something that happens and that will be really difficult but if you're looking at this customer segment i think that's where you need to try to target them okay thank you um we have also another question from Krzysztof. And he's asking for your point of view on which innovation in payments amazed you uh, the most as a customer? Oof, tough <laughs> one. So many, right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. I think uh, there are some of these things that are already out in, in the beta testing um, that I think will be really cool and change the environment of uh, payments. And one of those things are uh, how you can shop in stores and pay already in the changing booths so that you don't need to wait in the register. You can just put something on and you can see in the mirror that this is something I want and just pay right there uh, and go out of the store. Nothing, uh, nothing more than that. So just making payments really, really frictionless is something that will happen soon. And I think that's when it's going to really start to be super cool. Um, another thing like that is these stores that there is no cashier, you just have an app and you uh, register your card, take what you need, and then everything is registered automatically of what you took from that store. Uh, or for example, 
paying uh, with cars, like having tokenized payments in your car. Uh, that will be really cool as well, not having to uh, have your card ready when you enter a drive through or go into gas station. Everything will be really, really smooth. So that would be super cool. Hmm. Yeah, that sounds really cool, <laughs> actually. <laughs> Um, one of the questions that I also had in mind is how does banking in the Nordic uh, region differ from the others? Do you think there are any differences that you need to take into consideration for the card launch in particular, or is it very similar to others? Well, I do think so. I mean, the incumbent banks here in the Nordics have done a great job with the digital journey already. Uh, everyone has had a banking app for many years. Uh, online banking is something that is very uh, much used. And uh, they've been on this journey in closing down um, offices. So for, for us in that way, it's easier because everyone are used to going digital. Uh, but it's also putting higher pressure that it's not, not enough just to be digital. You need to do more. And I think this is where... Uh, the new banks are trying to tackle it. How do you do more in a good way where the customers really understand it? Because the incumbent banks or uh, apps are super easy to understand and you can just uh, do transfers and whatever you need. But what else? And that's where we come in and make sure that there is something else. I think, you know, like answering the question on how we can do more for customer is actually very common to any industry, yeah. <laughs> but then it's different, you know, on the how aspect, right? Exactly. And different from company to company, what they think, uh, what is how? Yeah. There's also a question from Maria and uh, she's asking, apart from customer feedback that you already mentioned, what other criteria do you use to validate product ideas? Uh, so we always also try to look at uh, what competition does. That's interesting. Um, and uh, together with data uh, to see if this customer feedback is really uh, valid or does it have another root cause? Because some of those feedbacks, uh, especially around usability or a product might not be uh, fixed that easy. There's many reasons on what why they're experiencing that problem. So you, you really need to dig in deep to all of those issues to make sure that you're solving the real problem and not just what they're saying. True that. <laughs> um, so there's... And one more <laughs> that I have is very overall. Um, and I feel like we've also been touching it uh, a little bit, but maybe there's something else that you would like to add. And the question is, building the bank of tomorrow, what is the next big thing in banking? Well, I think we touched upon this a bit earlier, uh, that banking, there's so much going on in banking right now. Um, in, in different fields, uh, both within the new fintechs that are coming up that are really helped customers during the pandemic, been there, been digital, uh, all of these new companies coming out with uh, Bitcoin applications and new type of finance. Uh, but there's still not this layer of what we think like personalization and intelligence. So we think that there's still a lot of room to disrupt banking and make sure that there is really someone there to help the customer along the way. And we are getting to one hour almost. You already were very you know, specific with all the answers for the questions. And I feel like we've like asked a lot to you. So thank you already for all the, all the answers that you gave. And I have just one more. Yeah. <laughs> So that one is something that we're asking to our speakers and uh, that we're having for Disruption Talks. Um, and the question is, if you had a magic wand, let's imagine that, and you can do anything with it, um, and you can cast a spell that allows you to provide education on a specific topic to all 12 years old in the world, what would it be? What would you want them to learn? 
it, I would uh, be a, a bad product management manager if I didn't say anything in, in payments or banking. So, I mean, there is so much still for a lot of people to learn when it comes to what you need to think about when it comes to how to save money, how to save money in a good way, what is a credit, how will that affect you, and what will it cost you in the long run. So I think really making sure that they understand banking and their personal finance is really important, especially now when there's no uh, real money to help them save in the piggy bank. How do you do this digitally in a good way so they understand that money is not something that just comes and goes. It's something that you need to earn and something you will spend and hopefully save as well so that you have a good financial life in the long run. I think that's a perfect way of closing our talk for today. Thank you, Helen, for your time and for all the answers that you gave us. Um, I hope you enjoyed it as well. <laughs> I did. Thank you so much, Paula. Thank you so much. And thanks, everybody, for listening to us. And see you on the next episode of Disruption Talks. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.